long time, been a long time coming. Whoa. Whoa. It's day four and chapter four of our fairy tale of New York reread. And uh, chapter four is an interesting one um, because it shows Rosie going home and sort of thinking about what's happened in the day. Um, she's some good things are happening in her life. Uh, she's just been asked by Mimi Sutton to do all the flowers for the Grand Winter Ball, which is kind of this huge. Uh, event that happens at Christmas, a big New York calendar event and Kowalski's has the contract which is a big coup for them. It's good for her professionally but also good for her personally because it's kind of validation for the business that she spent ages building up and working so hard to get a good reputation and so it seems like things are going right and then you just get a dream moment. She wakes from a dream and it's the first time that there's been a hint that there is something else going on with Rosie uh, other than this lovely happy life that she has, business that she loves, friends that she loves and who love her back, a beautiful city that she's totally in love with. Now when I wrote the book because I was telling myself the story as I went along I didn't actually know that this was going to happen until I wrote it. Uh, now when I start a book I, I'm a lot more planned I have to be because of writing to a deadline but writing this book I mean I wrote it over the best part of seven, seven, eight years before or I put it on the autonomy website and it got picked up by Avon um, and so I didn't know this was a bit of a surprise to me and I really like that I like that, that it kind of took me by surprise so I'm going to read you a little bit of the scene that night my dreams were incredibly vivid images flashed through my mind at supersonic speed Ed smiling Mimi Sutton in her magnificent office Brent's wide grin bumping into Nate Amy then suddenly I could feel a man's heartbeat and the warmth of his arms around me, his breath in my hair, it was wonderful. I felt safe. At first I couldn't make out his features and then I recognised him. The feeling of safety dissolved, replaced with a vice grip of nausea. Suddenly the scene changed. I was now standing in a garden facing a group of familiar faces. They were smiling at me, but I heard myself speak, voice full of emotion, fighting back tears. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I woke with a start. Shafts of moonlight pulled in through the bedroom window. Breathing hard, face wet with tears and perspiration, I sat bolt upright and looked around to gain my bearings. Reaching across to the bedside table, I snapped on the light. Slowly, the hammering of my heart eased, but the nausea sat defiant in my stomach. Get a grip, I chastised myself. It's just a dream. It's gone now. It isn't real. Well, it isn't real now, said a voice in my head, but it was once. Oh, what could it be? Um, and I still get that now. Like, I know what it is. And it's something that actually I've tried to hang on to as I've gone on and, and written novels and been a, a, a lot more planned about it, is that sense of telling myself the story. The, the late, great Sir Terry Pratchett said, uh, the first draft of anything is you telling yourself the story. And even though I might plan a lot better, I always want to leave that little gap of kind of not really knowing where the story's going so that I'm excited by it. So I kind of figure if I'm excited by the story, then hopefully my readers will be as well. Um, so there you go. Oh, cool. Now, I said that I was going to tell you about Nate Amy and where the inspiration came from, real life inspiration came. When I started writing the book, it was a really long time ago, um, I was living, I wasn't living in the Midlands where I'm living now. I was in my first marriage, which wasn't very happy and I had a very rare day where I had the car and I went out um, for the day and I ended up in a coffee shop as you do that I'd never been in before uh, and there was a guy who was serving and he was fascinating I mean he was sort of good looking but not good looking in the way that Nate is in the book but what really struck me was his worldview because he was he seemed like the happiest guy on the planet but whenever he talked about anything he was kind of uh, a pessimist with a real sense of humour and he made pessimism look fun. <laughs> now I count myself as an optimist and um, so this was totally different from my worldview but it, I, it was interesting to see someone so positive but really pessimistic about things um, and that just got me thinking. I, I was sort of fascinated by that and I thought what would happen if an optimist that things have gone wrong for meets a pessimist who has everything going right for him and that was the germ of the idea that started 
what became Fairy Tale of New York. Um, and it was that Rosie was the optimist, Nate was the pessimist. I don't know if that chap, I never went back in that, um, in the coffee shop. I don't know if the bloke ever realised that he had inspired a character in a book that then has gone on to sell over 200,000 copies um, around the world, translated into several different languages. But there you go, so if you go in a coffee shop, you might end up in an author's novel. That's it for today. So tomorrow, chapter five, lots more exciting stuff, and we are gonna talk about baddies. We're gonna talk about Mimi Sutton, and I will explain to you why I wanted to have a real baddie in my book. So there you go, thank you so much for reading. I do hope you're enjoying it. Thank you for your lovely comments on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. It's lovely to see so many people reading along, and uh, thank you for choosing my book to read. If you've got a question, you can tweet me at Wordsmith. I'm also Wordsmith on Instagram, Miranda Dickinson author on Facebook, or you can email me, MirandaWordy at gmail.com. Have a lovely day. Happy reading, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Been a long time, been a long time coming. Whoa.